Hi. Good evening and welcome to my channel. Um, this is the first time we've done one of these, so it's quite exciting. Uh, tonight, me and Gillian are going to be talking writer stuff and asking each other tricky questions or maybe not so tricky questions. We'll see how we go. So yeah. uh, how about you introduce yourself first? Okay, I'm Gillian St. Kevin. I write anything from paranormal romance to contemporary seasonal comedy to gothic romance to mythological fantasy to high fantasy to um legally blonde meets dracula i am a chaser of shiny things i love lots of different genres and i cannot resist mashing them together when i write so i am a mess but I am a published miss, so I've got that going for me at least. Well, good, good. I am also am a miss. I am Jamie Sands. I write um, urban fantasy primarily under this name, although I've also written uh, young adult horror um, and various other random things. The last book I published under my name is called uh, this unusual life and it's a collection of sort of short stories but it's articles from a gossip magazine from another dimension yeah um, and then i've also got uh two two pen names for romance so one is um sweet contemporary romance and one is less sweet and less contemporary <laughs> yeah both series very fun both <laughs> very fun <laughs> i have a lot of fun writing them uh good so um let's kick off with a really simple question that i'm sure everyone is dying to hear the answer to where do you get your ideas that's um, it's more it's well <laughs> yeah so ideas i don't oh hey megan's here hi megan oh, hi megan <laughs> Feel free to think of some questions for us, Megan, or also feel free to ignore us and be productive <laughs> despite the chat. Yeah, either way. <laughs> so try something. My idea, my stories usually come from a character or a vibe between two characters that I want to explore. Um, oh, I like that. <laughs> um, and I, it, it's generally a character with a problem or two characters who need to be together but are resisting that or don't know that yet mm -hmm. and then mm -hmm. things sort of expand or at least that's what happened in my, when I started writing now it, it, I'll generally be writing a story and think wouldn't it be cool if this other thing happened or a character will show up in a story. Um, the best example is um, do, do, do. writing the worst behaved werewolf. I'm three quarters of, I'm maybe three quarters or halfway through the story, and Rosemary shows up. Julian cannot outwit the fairies on his own. He needs help. Rosemary's been the fairy prisoner for most of 400 years basically they team up and it's amazing she is the older sister that julia never had and never wanted hmm. but she's not going to be happy with just one book appearance the <laughs> blog is rosemary getting her romance this is florence's story but rosemary's a major part of it and there's likely going to be a book with rosemary getting her character arc filled and so, he's going yeah, to so that's that's um characters demanding their attention demanding your attention yeah oh so again it's back to characters though another sort of sorry another gothic romancy story jamie did you ever read the isborn puzzle adventures as a kid Osborne puzzle adventures yes with um, you... Agent, Agent Arthur, were there a few with Agent? Yes. I loved those books so much. Yeah, me and my sister had those, and there was one of them. My favorite was called The Vanishing Village, and I yes. was like, I remember that okay, one. 
I love the vanishing village and I was like oh okay what is cool and gothic a vanishing village would be super cool and gothic I'm going to write a <laughs> gothic mystery with a vanishing village and instead yep. of um vanishing it turned into time travel and instead yep. of a village it was a Roman bath and that was the mystery of Brackenwell Hall mm -hmm. so the other interesting thing about that story is it came from my own experience as being chronically ill for a really long time mm. so I guess it's a combination oh and then another one of my gothic romances is totally me having issues with religion and exploring those issues through somebody else's life mm -hmm. basically mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so it's a combination <laughs> interesting characters yeah. ideas I think are cool in therapy for my own <laughs> I hear that I hear that so so much <laughs> oh actually a third source or fourth source sorry thorns and fangs is started with an argument I had with my sister so I'm going to grab them because this is hilarious you need to see this <laughs> an argument you had with your sister yeah I'm trying to think if I've ever had a story like that I don't think I have I don't really argue with my sister. That probably doesn't help. Oh, we we get on on very well now. I have to say that we are we appreciate each other a lot more yep. than we did as yep. teenagers. Oh, no, that's and, fair. I did fight with my sister a lot when we were both teenagers. Yeah, this yep. is an argument with my sister. I gave one of my main characters one side of the argument the other main character another side of the argument four yep. books later they finally got together and were happy four that's pretty adorable <laughs> i told oh, my sister amazing. about it and she was like she didn't say anything but she had that face that i am clearly uncomfortable with this <laughs> People don't like to know if they've turned up in your books in any any kind of capacity, I think. Yep. Though so, um, I think when real people show up in my books, I often don't realise that until later. Yeah. The other thing is I don't think there's any risk of people recognising themselves in my work because when I write somebody, a character, I'm writing them as I see them yeah. Which is very different, I think, from how very people different. see themselves. Yeah. So, and for me too, like I will, I will use a part of someone, but I won't use everything. I'll, you know, this person has this person's um, mannerisms, perhaps, but doesn't have their beliefs and and would act differently. Something like that. You know, I'll just use little bits. So for me, where do my ideas come from? A remarkable amount of my ideas comes from dreams I've had. So. Oh, as a teenager, I got really into a bunch of new age stuff. That's where I first got my first set of um, tarot cards. And I had a book and it was about how you can train yourself to remember your dreams and what do dreams mean and dream interpretation and stuff. So for about a year and a half, I, uh, as soon as I woke up, I'd write down whatever I could remember from my dream. And that trained me apparently for life to have really good dream recall. And my dreams are very yeah. strange and very vivid. And um, they'll have very strange things come. So a lot of my short stories, a lot of the LARPs I've written, and every now and then a novel will come out of a dream I have had. <laughs> it is Sometimes really, really cool. <laughs> um, one of the dreams I had that turned into a LARP um, made a whole lot of people cry when they played it. So that was really good. <laughs> it was about... Um, it was about so you know do you know the tv show dollhouse where there's um these people and they they have their memories wiped but they go off and do certain things they like get programmed yeah sort of like that except it's like six or seven um people who would go out and do missions so it wasn't like dollhouse it's a lot of sex and that um and the, in my dream it was like they'd go out and do like heists or they would um serve the government or something it was all in this controlled environment and the twist was that they were all from different part points in time so there was um a guy who was a really good gunner and they'd taken him from world war ii and there was a guy who was really good at strategy and they'd taken him from and they couldn't remember that but the memories were starting to bleed through 
Yeah. So I ran it as a game um, with, I think, eight people, two people who worked at the um, worked at the facility and the rest with a team. And I ran, I think, three times. It went very, very badly twice. Um, and not not the game, but the way the story went. And I found it very yeah. unsatisfying. So I ran it a third time and it finally ended the way I wanted. And everyone was crying and talking about their feelings and it was a happy ending. And so I was like, cool, I never need to um, run this again, <laughs> which is a pity. So um, dreams, and sometimes like you, it's characters. A character will jump into my head. Sometimes, yeah. I, um, sometimes I get the idea for the kind of book I want to write. So that's what happened with my pirate books. I knew I wanted to write some kind of um, gay harem and I sort of went through, well, what are the situations where you get a lot of men um, together, forced force proximity, uh, and I knew I didn't want to write military, and I didn't want to write, like, a workplace, like a like a hospital or something like that. Um, and then I thought, well, what's going to be the most fun? And I just ended up on pirates, <laughs> because pirates are fun. And then I started writing them supernatural, and it all just went out the window. Um, <laughs> so, yeah yes um characters the idea for the book dreams i've had and some of that stuff will just pop into my head as well yeah and it might turn into something or it might not do you get that do you have a a notebook yeah. full of vague phrases that make no sense i don't write them down hmm. but i sort of i have so many ideas that i forget if i forget it's not meant to be but, for example, I have um, a character who kind of came into being in 29, August 2019 at conference as part of a fun brainstorming exercise. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Um, he is still kicking around. He really wants the book. <laughs> <laughs> and so, yeah. In time in time, mm -hmm. time <laughs> yeah. awesome. so i'd like to ask a question now and i really like the question that megan's given us yes. how do you know an idea is worth pursuing i'm just gonna update there um well it's a pretty short answer for me because um i either don't <laughs> Or, um, <laughs> so how do I say this? So I, <clears throat> if, if it sticks around with me, if it's not just like one and one day, oh, that would be a good idea. And then the next day I'm not thinking about it, then that's not worth pursuing. Um, if I'm thinking, still thinking about the second day or the third day, I will, um, try and flesh it out a little bit, assuming if I've got the time, but in my past, I have started to write stuff that really wasn't a good idea. And I've got, um, you know, 10 or 20,000 words into something before going, this is, it's just spinning wheels. There's nothing actually yeah. happening. Um, so I'm not great at knowing that <laughs> myself. Um, usually if I've got through the planning stage now, um, if I've got through the planning stage and I feel excited about the beats and everything, then it's probably a good idea for me. But having said that, what's a good idea? I can probably finish it. <laughs> but it doesn't mean anyone's going to buy it right <laughs> yeah yeah um it has been quite a while since i have not finished a book um i've got a difficult well i've got a story that is being difficult right now and i'm taking a break from it mm. but i'm it's not abandoned i'm coming back to it but um in fact, the other, the most recently abandoned story, I still want to finish. I think the idea is, is worth it. Yeah. But um, a lot of my ideas sort of fall by the wayside after three or four days and I sort of get bored of it. Sure. So, like Jamie, um, if I'm not thinking about something for after three or four days, then it's a sign that it's not going to sustain my interest another good sort of um what's the word measure for me is if i pitch the idea to someone 
and it doesn't immediately kill all interest in the idea. Like I like to tell stories and if I can tell someone the story yeah. and still want to tell it after I've done that, yeah. then um, then I know it's a keeper. So having said that, I have told the plot of the story I'm working on now to to several people, but I haven't told them the whole story. I'm holding stuff back because I want them to read it and be surprised I'm being a complete yep. arsehole, honestly. <laughs> so that actually brings up something else, which is slightly off topic, but um, I know that there are a lot of writers who get very, very superstitious about not sharing any details of their current works. Um, obviously, you're not on that boat <laughs> and neither am I but you don't want to share everything right what's where's the line for you um I am a massive oversharer in real life <laughs> and <laughs> of, in my writing life um so I'm not sure if I have a line um I think the line for me is not when when I'm done telling people but what I think will interest people yeah. like yeah. um nobody wants to hear how being sick in Japan influenced the plot of the mystery of Brackenwell Hall and why I'm still salty about being made to go to the midnight service on <laughs> Christmas Eve <laughs> terrible crap, right <laughs> so, so I think that's probably the limit for me. Yeah. I'm not worried about people saying, oh, my gosh, that's a cool idea. I'm totally going to steal it because nobody can write like me. Yeah. And so if somebody did take one of my ideas, it would be different. Mm. And um, I would probably enjoy reading it because I write the stories that I want to read. So um, if I did get into a situation where you know I was accused of plagiarism because somebody stole one of my ideas which I know is a fear for a lot of writers um I back up my work I save things and I share stuff with beta readers and alpha readers so I think I could prove actually no I did not steal this this was mine yeah, yeah. um so yeah I have no limits no filters no <laughs> Fair enough. <laughs> what about you? I'm, I'm um, curious now. Yeah, you draw I, the line. I think what I will do usually is just um, just the information that I'd give away in a blurb. So just like yep. that, that hook or that, oh, my God, I'm writing this. Like um, later this year I'm going to write um, what if the secret garden was a gay romance um, at a supernatural academy. Yep because <laughs> why not right and that's you know yep. I don't care if someone else writes that because it's fant it sounds fantastic I would read it and like you said um someone else would write it differently to me I'm sure of it <laughs> two things I have been looking at not the secret garden but the little princess and thinking how can I do this but gay should or, we, should, or we make a, should we do a shared universe of like reimagined victorian literature because i'd be so down for that <laughs> oh yes right. oh my I gosh i reread secret gun look at all the notes that i've <laughs> all the moments that i want to reference <laughs> yeah um <Thank> you. <laughs> one thing, on M on the facebook group mm book Week today somebody mm -hmm. said i'm looking for anne of green gables but gay, does anyone have oh, any suggestions? So good. I mean, if I was going to, if this does okay and I did another one, Anna Green Gables might well be the one that I go for because I love that book and she's such a yeah. fascinating character. But yes, um, um, I would usually just oh, be like, oh, what are you writing? If someone said, what are you writing right now? I'd just, I'd just give them the elevator pitch, I think. Because I, I actually yeah. think people would get bored listening to too much detail yeah. about my book and I don't want to bore them. <laughs> yeah. I, I want people to, I want to tell people my ideas, but I also want them to have the experience of reading them. So I, yeah, it's it's a constant struggle. Um, when I was teaching English in Japan, 
Yes. In one of the towns I lived in, there was a Canadian assistant language teacher there, and he was the grandson of L. M. Montgomery. Aww. And I hate to say this, but he was a complete asshole. He was the <laughs> one of the worst human beings I've ever met. But <laughs> well, <laughs> I mean, it was still the quite cool. Are often, like, not very nice to start with. So, <laughs> yeah, um, that's disappointing. It was very disappointing. <laughs> All right, um, should, we, should we jump on to Megan's next question? Yep, Who you'll need to update the question text. I've just done it. Okay. Cool. <laughs> so uh, this, oh, where have I gone? Where's my chat gone? Is there a time when you just want to break out of the genre or the world that you are writing? Um, I... With Thorns and Fangs, because it was a very long series, and every one of those books is a long book. The longest is 120K, and then the shortest one, I think, was 90K. Um, I did get a bit tired of it, especially since I had to write the second, rewrite the second book in the series three times and to get to the finished product. Yeah. So towards the end, books two and three were a struggle. Book four, it was easy. It was just a home run. It felt really good. Yeah. But I was really keen to take a break. And I think I wrote Deep Magic in between those books and the other Deep Magic stories. Oh, yeah. So, um, yeah, I just, think. Yeah. I think yeah, that's so I. I'm getting too bored. I'll just switch to another project um, for a bit until I feel guilty and come back to the original one. Um, and because I write over different pen names, different universes, it's quite easy to just jump in. It's, um, my my silly um, alternate universe gossip rag was actually written as a Patreon project. So it I was writing it for every month for um, about a year. That was mm -hmm. really good because if I got really sick of what I was writing, I'd just jump in, write a thousand words or whatever on this completely ridiculous nonsense um, that was just downloading the weirdest part of my brain, space, my brain basically. And it was so refreshing. I like, just mm -hmm. come back in. And, okay, I've done that now. What was I working on? <laughs> yeah. Yep. The second part of Megan's question is, is there a time when you just want to break out of the genre or world? Neither one of us have really stuck to a single genre, have we? No. <laughs> I don't think I've even stuck to a single genre for a entire story. I, I have I have with Fairyland. Fairyland a oh, very a very straightforward Hallmark style romantic comedies set in a theme park. They are very, very much the same world. I don't and I've, I've made a deal with myself that they are never going to get actually magic and they're never going to have real smut on the on the page. So um, those books, I would say, they're my Jackson Knight ones, are very much contained. But when you're writing other stuff like urban fantasy or, um, just, you know, paranormal, you, you, it doesn't, I mean, you can break out and it doesn't matter. It's still part of it, right? <laughs> you can yeah. You can throw whatever you want in. And it's still part of the genre, as long as you write yeah. it well enough. My gothic romances, there's a straight-up murder mystery there. There is, an, I guess, a very erotic romance. Anything with Waremu and Patrick in it is very hot. Um, <laughs> there is time travel. There are ghosts. Yeah. There is a werewolf romance. Um sure. There is a sort of coming of age slash straight up horror story with the lady of the bog. Mm. Um, yeah. And um, there's a couple of books in that series that sh do not have any romantic elements at all, either because right. the main character is too young yeah. or um, he's ace and is more oh. after the friendship companionship aspect. Yeah. Yeah. Um, there is a second chance romance with like an elderly postmaster and a retired curmudgeon. 
and a twist romance where the um the selkie that francis thinks is right for him um as soon as he gets his skin back he's like see ya i'm out of here <laughs> i like that for a selkie story though i don't i don't like the oh no actually i am in love with you no no yep um, <laughs> i have talking of ideas for stories i have a reader who really wants to leave to show up again leaf mm -hmm. is the selkie yeah. and i was like i was not intending that to happen mm -hmm. but it's been sitting there for a while and any time now that i have a story that takes place near the water or on the water or water <laughs> is involved i'm like maybe <laughs> time? is it time <laughs> do you also find we didn't talk about this with ideas but um i always remember neil gaiman talking about this and someone asked him like where do you get ideas and one of his answers was that uh people will come to him because he's such a big author and ask him to be involved in their anthologies and he's and he gave the example he's like for example someone wrote me an email and said i want to imagine someone wrote an email that said we want you to write a story for this anthology about cats who perform shakespeare and he's like oh no i don't have time for that you know uh, no never mind and then overnight something will happen he'll wake up with a brilliant idea for a story where a cat writes shakespeare <laughs> <laughs> or place yeah. you know like this seed has been planted and the subconscious turns it into something have you ever this had that happen is, is yeah it yeah. <laughs> so i find that setting rules for myself or having a prompt having a prompt never works for me people throw oh. random phrases and stuff and that and i'm just like no that's stupid oh, yeah. um which is really w interesting actually because there's really little that makes me go no <laughs> that strongly <laughs> um, my very first book that i published suburban book of the dead started as a five minute writing prompt that's fantastic that is really cool the end of summer um a fairground and someone screams yeah and that's wow. how i started writing that book <laughs> When I decided I was going to stop writing fanfic and be a serious author TM, I had a, I was like, okay, so I'm going to do this properly. I'm not going to write any sex. I'm not going to write any fight scenes and no one's going to die in my books. And then I had a year and a half where I had no ideas. I tried to write, nothing worked. It was all just complete. It just wasn't working at all. And then I got the story I germ for Thorns and Fangs. And in that series, there was a lot of sex. There was a lot of violence and fight scenes. And Nate dies halfway through the first book. He doesn't die, die, yeah. but he dies. Makes and I broke all of my rules in that one book and it just unblocked me. And I was like, yeah. wow, okay, I guess I'm an, a paranormal romance writer. But, and so I put myself in that box and then yeah. as soon as I did that, yeah. my romance plots went down and the mystery and twisty plot just took <laughs> over the books. So you have um, oh, contradictory sorry. muse. <laughs> yeah, um, Life After Humanity, one of the books in that series was based on the experience of renewing my visa in Japan. Um, ben is an ex-vampire who's now human, but his humanity license is denied. His application for humanity is denied, and so he's in limbo. <laughs> I, I, too, have a Japan... Um inspiration story the second book in my fairy tale room uh, fairyland romances uh, mischief and mayhem i'd written the first one and then i got married and went on honeymoon to japan and the first four days at tokyo disney resort and i told myself i, I didn't have to do any writing it was the honeymoon i was just going to relax and let my brain unpack because i'd been organizing a wedding and everything it was really really stressful also my job got restructured that year it was a big year um, and then we were on Space Mountain, um, which is my favorite roller coaster at Disney. Um, and we were just sitting there, ready to go. And 
it starts and they there's a guy there to wave at you like as you leave i think he's really checking that everyone's secure but but he just sort of waves you off and i'm like huh that's an interesting thing what if i was really scared of doing this and that guy had to stop the thing because he could see i was having a panic attack and that's the seed that uh became mischief and mayhem where i've got a a war vet who's got ptsd um and can't ride the the big fancy roller coaster because it brings stuff back and he falls in love with yeah. the guy who runs the roller coaster that is so, fantastic <laughs> that's that was it and then i was i just turned to my my spouse and i was like i think i just had a story idea and she's like okay um and then i started writing and i wrote i think half of it while we were on holiday i have an unfinished fanfic set in tokyo disney world i just realized What's the, so, what's the universe? What uh, characters? Um, so ages ago, I was in a live journal role play game called Camp Fuck You Die. Um, and the premise is that a whole bunch of campers, basically anyone under 18 from any fictional universe, the oh. stipulation was that it had to be published, no self-published works, mm -hmm. um, get sent to this camp that is constantly getting invaded by zombies and there's no very little in the way of supplies it was a free form role play basically and after a few rounds we had counselors come in so people could play um adult characters but they were very limited and it was mostly stupid overpowered teenagers from all these different anime live action shows everything <laughs> um i played superboy from and this is very important from the 90s comic run so when he was cousin. really embarrassing yes 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 um, i love that I, character <laughs> i don't know if you are aware of the um there was a 12 issue run by i forget his name and champagne where it was just really surreal and hilarious and mm. i loved it <laughs> But, I remember yes. once we crossed over with um, Tim Drake Robin because I shipped the two of them. Oh, oh yeah. my gosh, we have so much to talk about. <laughs> um, okay, we shouldn't go down too much of a tangent though. <laughs> no, um, but in uh, during the Young Justice series, it is discovered that Con's favorite TV show is Were Wendy the Werewolf Stalker. Yes, that's right. Also at this camp was Buffy. Con immediately hit on Buffy. Yeah. She turned him down. This is Buffy in sure. the Angel era, so it's Angel or nothing. Yeah. Yeah. Con yeah. made a few more attempts, but respected <laughs> her, and then generally was just like a friend. And he was a yeah. super good friend. Oh. And they they're both shallow. This yeah. sounds terrible. Yeah, Very no, appearance no. orientated. They've both been yeah. given like massive responsibilities that they didn't really ask for and they're trying to live up to impossible expectations <laughs> while also being immature teenagers. Yeah. And they yeah. clicked. Yeah. Yeah. And um <laughs> they ended up dating for like years they got married it was ridiculous but buffy's player came to japan and we hung out at tokyo disneyland so we wrote um, or i wrote i forget now this really it was dcu crossed with buffy verse crossed with other random characters from the live yep. journal role play yep. yeah yeah Megan's listening, going, what the hell? <laughs> Just very briefly, and then we'll move on to the next question. But I also have a live journal role playing experience. I, my freeform uh, multi genre game was called Hogwarts Hocus. And the idea was it was any character you could think of arriving at Hogwarts. Um, and the only rule was that you weren't allowed to play anyone from Harry Potter unless you were specifically approved. So I yeah. joined as Hayley from Firefly. Oh and, yes, um, and oh. enough that I got to be Harry Potter. <laughs> wow. Okay, I remember Kaylee, and I may have read some of your posts, like really vaguely. <laughs> she ended up really getting on with um, a grown-up Adam from Good Omens. And, yeah. Um, she was flirting the fuck out of him, but he would never respond. 
in the way she wanted. And then the other one she had a crush on was Steer Pike from um, Gormenghast. Yep. So I. <laughs> why not? <laughs> I never Hilarious. finished the Harry Potter books. So I was like, oh, look, okay, whatever. I'm not interested. But I have friends who were like, oh my God, this Kaylee, you've got to read this. Um, we had a Firefly cast at mm. um, at camp, yeah. and I know for a fact there were people who apped into Hulk Hulk's Pocus to play with you. Holy crap. <laughs> That's hilarious. That's so, yeah. oh, God, what a small world. Because I remember someone joined who was a really good Dr. Simon Tam, and um, we had a lot of really fun. He was, like, maximum awkward um dr simon and it was so was, much fun was his player australian i don't remember i don't remember anything about any of the actual players uh except the woman who was she was a mod and she played jenny weasley she's yeah. like you can play harry potter as long as that's the ship and i'm like that's fine um although my harry potter had quite a thing with um edward elric from full metal Alchemist. oh that is amazing <laughs> like never actually went anywhere but we were like mm -mm -mm. <laughs> anyway I, um, that, is, that is so funny i can't believe that yes. <laughs> early early 2000s me is very pleased that someone appreciated their writing <laughs> yes in that ridiculous ridiculous game uh, right <laughs> megan <move> apologies <laughs> so it was not what <laughs> you wanted it was not what anyone wanted <laughs> Okay, the next question Megan has, and it's, I'd say, kind of related to what we've been talking about. Have you had characters that scare you? <laughs> uh, no apology needed, she says. Okay, good. Megan, um, you were too kind. My most frightening character, again, this was based on a dream I had, um, was, in retrospect, written about how unhappy I was in my last marriage um he was a serial killer and he was actually the um horseman of the apocalypse pestilence uh and was just walking around wellington with um this other person in tow just straight up killing everyone and it's really i loved writing that story but i was like is there something wrong with me um <laughs> why am i why am i writing all this really gory horror and then hilariously that week we went and saw the pillow man um which is a really confronting play um by the guy who wrote in bruges and um my spouse at the time wanted to leave at half time and i said no there's no way i have to know what happens um but it was very cathartic that is true um in retrospect it was very cathartic i've rewritten it a few times to make it less horrifying and i do have this idea that someday i'm going to put it together with a couple of other stories i wrote with all four horsemen having their own story yeah. but i could never get a good read on how to write a, a short story for war so mm. Mm. the pestilence one and the famine ones are really good but then i kind of fell apart mm. i don't think i've had a character <laughs> hear me mm. because um yeah, I am a massive wimp, but um, I, which surprises people because I write horror and occasionally some quite sad or dark things. But um, I can write it. I can't take it when other people write it. <laughs> and I like that when I'm the author, I know what well, you know what's going to happen, happen right? what, in yeah. control. I mean, yeah. like. Um, characters go down different tangents and plots don't end up the way that i think they're going to end up but um i i've yeah i've never had anything a moment where i was really dismayed but at the depths of what someone was capable of mm. um my deep magic series feature Morganelle who are fae folk who in this universe anyway they're Welsh water spirits and in this universe they were driven into the ocean by people just encroaching 
further and further throughout the land and they adapted to life in the water and they're now mermaids without the tails basically mm. and they're very long lived they grow very slowly and you know they are they have lots of power and they're lots of magic and they do not have empathy mm. or at least it's not natural to them yeah so um i have situations where i think maybe i should be more horrified than i am um do he went it's an awkward teenager and there was another awkward teenager moping after him because do he went isn't interested in dating him sure. and ewan is like oh this is a problem i will solve this problem and make do he went like me so he's like Simon, come over here. And then he tries to drown Simon. And oh Ewan sees nothing wrong with this. And uh, he went, it's like, you can't drown people. I'll get in trouble. He's like, he's not like you can't drown someone because that would be terrible. He's like, if you drown him, Meridian's going to blame me and I'll never hear the end of it. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So, and that is, I think that's hilarious. Should I be worried? <laughs> nah. <laughs> Maybe. Nah. <laughs> um, I think for me, because I, I read so much horror um, mm -hmm. and watch so much horror, it doesn't really, I don't get, I know I never go as far as some other people will um, in my yeah. own writing. And also I've, I've done a lot of tabletop role play and, and a lot of those characters that I've tried out have been really dark. Um, one of my favorite ones is a game based on, you know, the BBC TV show Being Human, where there's a, a ghost and a werewolf and a vampire just flatting together. There's a yeah. game based on that. It's called Blood and Water, and it's absolutely fantastic. And the idea is you're all magical or paranormal or whatever, but the conflict in the game is all about the fact that you live together. Like, the problems aren't that the vampire coven's going to find you. It's that no one's taken out the rubbish. And um, yeah. my character for that was a resurrected boy who um, had been pieced together by witches from various boys' parts um, and was basically a zombie. And <laughs> they're like okay so so what's the issue with you is is obviously that you're a bit dead like, yeah um and sometimes probably i eat people but i don't mean to like you know it's it's just something that happens sometimes and then my big character um conflict was that the the people who live next door trusted me and wanted me to babysit their kids oh no <laughs> and as a player i'm like that's amazing I, and, and but i really don't want them to go and eat the children right so it's really tense to play this like i really want to do well i can only speak like two words a minute but i'm gonna look after these kids <laughs> so um you know that's just one example but i've played a lot of different horror characters and and gone some pretty dark places so i guess it's not as much an issue for me yeah i think so when i'm in an awkward situation in real life i I sort of cope by making light of the situation or making a joke. Yeah. So I think that maybe because my that's my sort of coping mechanism when I write horror or mm. edgier stuff, I do tend to make it, it funny. Oh, look, Megan, yeah. two words, not food. Um, well, except that sometimes, <laughs> actually, in that game, I, I tended, I actually ended up being the nicest one because um, we had a guy who was basically a mermaid, and he kept, um, he kept drowning people. So it, was it, happens. it happens. Like, what are you going to do about it? People drown. I just hide the evidence, I guess. <laughs> oh, okay. So, um, I did write something that freaked me out. I oh, yeah. have. A, I have a murder mystery series that I've got. The first book is like three quarters of the way written. It is a siren and a non-binary witch set in Akaroa. Mm. So, um, and it happened, it starts when the siren is, um, he is sulking in a cave. He's been sulking in this cave for a hundred years or so. He's having a proper sulk 
And then somebody dumps a dead body in his underwater cave. And he's like, ugh. Sharks are going to find this. If I, and then she, once you get sharks, like they keep coming back. They've got those freaking stupid memories. Ugh. Okay, I, I will get rid of this body. And so he puts the body up on the shore and leaves it where it will be found and then goes back under the water. Yeah. But, like, because he had left his cave and when he dumped the body on the beach, there were, like, bellbirds singing and it was a nice day and now he's restless. So when he hears this boat, like, zooming around the harbour, he's like, okay, I, I, maybe I'll just go seduce and drown one person one. And then I'll go back to sulking. Just like yeah. one, one little treat. <laughs> Unfortunately, the this person is the witch who um, steals the siren's voice, binding them together, and then ties him up and takes him to the police station and dumps him and goes like, look, here's your murderer. And the police are like, what? This sounds incredible. <laughs> and the siren's like, yeah, I saw him... You know, yeah, the, body. yeah, I saw him dumping a body. He is your guy. Yeah. And the siren is like, I don't know who this guy is. He's plainly insane. <laughs> I've just been minding my own business. <laughs> and then the police, while they're trying to sort this out, they get a call. There's been another murder Fantastic. that took place while they were there in the police station. So the witch knows the siren is innocent. Oh, and the siren's like, give me back my voice so I can kill you. And the witch is like, I'm obviously not going to do that. <laughs> and so so the Simon's like, okay, I need to lull the witch into a false sense of security so he will give, they will give me my voice back and I can kill him then. Yeah. And so he goes to the pub and people, the local policeman has told everyone this hilarious story about how the local psychic thought he'd solved a murder and was completely wrong. So they're all making fun of the witch. And the, the Simon's like, this is brilliant. Look, let's, you know, I'm not guilty. I know you want to solve this murder. Let's team up, find the real killer, and you can give me back my voice. And the witch is like, no, not happening. <laughs> But they, we have to finish they, this. Yeah, they are reluctantly working together. They yeah. are solving clues. They're putting things together. The siren is learning about the world and they're having brunch. And the obnoxious male police officer comes in to harass them, basically, because the witch is now a prime suspect. <laughs> and the, the witch says something offhand like, oh, you know, I wish he'd take a, he'd, he'd do us a favour and drop dead. And the siren's like, yes, that's my cue. Siren so follows the cop into the forest and kills him. And I felt really awful writing that. Yeah. yeah. And I actually had to change it from a deliberate murder to an accidental death. Right. But the intent was there. Yeah. And then... Um, Anyway, I've got to the part of the book where the um, where the witch is like, okay, I trust you now. We can work together. You know, we need to figure out who killed all of these people, including the police officer. And the sign is like, wait, I killed the police officer. <laughs> and I was like, I'm so well, I don't want to write this scene. <laughs> oh. It's such a great setup, though. It's so good. <laughs> well, I am. So, this was supposed to be a sweet, cozy mystery. And you know, the elements of a cozy mystery like no smut. No smut. Like long burn romance that builds over books and books and books and books. And the only, um, the only people who die are very evil. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> So in addition to murdering a police officer on screen in detail, the son <laughs> has, has unresolved sexual tension with the witch. He has yeah. a friends with lots on very frequent benefits with um, a paddleboard instructor. 
And the police officer supervisor surprised him by um, kissing him in a forest. So he's now got three love interests. Okay, so for me, I, I mean, there's an obvious solution here. <laughs> it's you publish yep. it, paranormal gay harem. Uh. <laughs> Dark paranormal gay harem. You'll be fine. <laughs> People love that. <laughs> Yeah, Megan has got the most important question that any author has got to answer. As authors, what responsibility do you think you have to present people and issues ethically? Um, you have all the responsibility. Yeah. Um, no, so as, as a cis woman writing gay romance like i do feel a lot of responsibility to be respectful and for me that means that every character i write is a person and not a stereotype yeah. and what i write is not objectifying or um overly eroticizing yeah, yeah. Um, since, since figuring out that I am not straight <laughs> and that, um, I, oh, this is, so a few, it took me a few years ago to come out as lesbian. And when I did, my family's reaction was, we thought you knew. <laughs> so it's, it was a very slow, gentle awakening, but <laughs> since then, I feel a lot more confident writing queer characters across the lgbtqia spectrum because i know that my experience shows that this is not a one size fits all oh, situation absolutely. so even if i write a character and get something wrong for one person who's to say that's not right for someone else yeah yeah and i think as long as you're not doing anything harmful right so um, I've run into this a little bit with my Fairyland series because I really very much want to have diverse characters and the first one is a white guy and a um, half Jamaican black guy and um, I had to treat really carefully because obviously I don't have that ethical um, experience so I just treat it very lightly um, and I mean they're light books anyway I don't tend to go deep into a whole lot of stuff but it's it's kind of kicking me in the ass at the moment because the next story I want to write is the um, there's a, a recurring in um secondary character through all of them who's a non-binary um like people manager very very organized um and and a fantastic interesting person but in the first book as a throwaway line i made them first nations um native american and like i really feel like that's a line i can't cross <laughs> because i've got no experience of that I, the only thing i've got is is hollywood but at the same time, I want to write their story because it feels unfair not to have them <laughs> lead a story. And I want to have a non-binary lead as well. And they've, they're my main, main non-binary character. So it's really tricky. I'm, I'm thinking of um, just running the idea past a couple of friends I have on a, an author Slack um, who are Native American and just say, like, what's your perspective on this? Because it is a lightweight story. It's a romantic comedy. But that doesn't mean I can just do stuff lightly, right? So I have definitely made the, made the mistake in the past of not getting feedback on ideas soon enough. Yeah. Um, in the haunted bedchamber, Wirumu is a Maori protagonist who ends up in a house with that looks like it has a ghost. But it, it looks like a poltergeist situation, but it's actually something different. Mm -hmm. But he goes into it thinking it's a ghost. Right. And so, however, as a, as a friend pointed out to me, <laughs> um, the Maori beliefs around the dead make Wurumu putting himself in the situation or staying in the situation very unlikely. I did not get that feedback until I'd written the story. I had to go through and rework it mm. so that Wirimu had ways of staying in this house 
believing it was tapu, but also taking steps to prevent himself sure. Sure. from from getting yeah. Different. Yeah. Yeah. So really kicking myself for that. At that stage in my writing career, yeah. I should have known better and I did know better. I just let um deadline pressure. Yeah. I took a shortcut basically and in hindsight, it was not a good idea. Yeah. Hopefully, I've learned something. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, I agree with you. I think we have every responsibility. Um, I mean, I've always been very big on ethics and um, really not want to... I, I, what I want to do with my books, ultimately, is to make the world a better place. Like, that's my big goal, because if I can make someone laugh when they weren't laughing anyway, or, you know, give someone an escape from something that they need to escape from, then that's making the world a better place for them. So the last thing yeah. I want to do with my fiction is hurt someone with it. So um, obviously I've made mistakes in the past and I'll absolutely make mistakes again, but I'm perfectly happy to go back, edit, um, take out the stuff that's, you know, upsetting someone and just re-release basically. I've done that before um, with my yeah. books. So there are a few stories that i don't think i will ever write like a gritty honest coming out oh, God. story um one because that is not my lived experience and i feel <laughs> like that is that is not my story to tell basically but also and i'm guessing from your reaction you feel the same way we need queer stories where queerness is accepted and is not the main focal point of uh, the character arc or the st character's identity, where it is a feature but not mm -hmm. the feature. Yeah, and, and, that's, I why I think, and that's, that's what I did with my Fairyland books. None of the conflicts between any of the characters um, or, or arcs in the stories are about being gay or being queer or trans um there is a character or two who has some issues with their folks or their family um but it's in the background it's usually sorted out um but it's never the main focus i want happy stories for queer people and you know so many of the stories we get in media are not that <laughs> you know so yeah. many and, there's sort of hard coming out and someone dies at the end and i'm just like nah i'm done i don't want that yep so my gut feeling is that um, Black, Indigenous, people of colour, um, neurodiverse folk, um, people with disabilities all want um, people with um, non-Christian identities, um, religions, mm -hmm. all want to see themselves in fiction without the baggage and yeah. so I have stopped feeling a lot of guilt about oh as a white woman do I have the right to write about to tell a black woman's story well no other writer has my peculiar combination of ideas they wouldn't want them if they had them they'd be like yeah no thanks i want to write something that sounds better <laughs> but as long as i do it respectfully and um put what i know is true about the world into the story and into the characters then i have a pretty good chance of getting it right yeah. And when that's not to say that um, I don't do research, um, the character that I'm thinking of, Hester, in The Vampire's Relic, I found an amazing reference book, like published by a university lecturer and made available for free. Um, I, I, I'll have to dig it out somewhere, but it was... Um, yeah basically it was just the life of this um this black actor who was um people in um victorian europe were crazy about him he did othello and a couple of other really big shakespearean roles he was like um 
a celebrity. And um, I kind of based Hester's arc and story and ambitions on, on him. Mm. And I had just so much fun writing her, although she was not very cooperative, but, you know. <laughs> well, that's the thing. And, like, I don't think there's inherently anything wrong with writing characters who are different to yourself as long as you're doing it with research and maybe with a sensitivity reader. Because, yeah, you know, sensitivity. Um, Readers are because there's a lot of um there's a lot of talk about people taking away opportunities um for people of color publishing but if we're self-publishing that's not an issue like it's we're not going to a big four um publisher and taking a spot that could be someone else's we're just chucking stuff up on amazon you know <laughs> anyone can do no. that. although i do think we can um you know, share and lift the work of other other writers oh, in the yeah. groups that we're writing about, yeah. and that we should. Um, I like, I like to pick people up as much as I can. I'm not sure I understand your next question, Megan. Oh, so I think um, oh. those who do not identify as gay think that the only topic we will write about is tragic, how hard it is coming out stories or erotica. Yes. Thing. Yeah, but, but, um, there is. <laughs> I fell into this trap, this way of thinking. So, um, oh, she said it's a I, really, but yeah, yeah. <laughs> but um, when I wrote Thorns and Fangs, I thought, well, you know, if I'm not, if there's not gay sex and a big romance in the story, then why does it matter they're gay? God, geez. Yeah. So, and then. It wasn't until much later when, like, I realized that I did not enjoy the romance so much as I enjoyed the character dynamics and the plot and the mystery elements that I realized I could write gay fiction. And I think that's kind of where the umbrella I put myself in now, except that that's not a very descriptive term. So, yeah, LGBTQ plus story. <laughs> Years, but yeah, there's definitely that that perception. Yeah, there is, there is, and and like it, there's a basis in reality for that as well because the stories that do really well in literary circles about gay people are all the mm. horror of coming out and one of you dies and you have to grieve, like Brokeback Mountain or whatever. So those books, those stories do really well, um, in in the big like New York Times bestseller way. And then if you're looking at more self-published stuff the erotica sells really well so so you get a lot of it on the market because people want to make money so yep, are, I, guess, yeah, I get where the beliefs yeah. come from <laughs> yep, erotica sells really well unless you try and write comic erotica which does not work yeah, that's fair, that's fair. <laughs> i don't know I've, I've got a lot of jokes in my erotica it sells all right but <laughs> okay then i need to do what you're doing <laughs> Basically, oh, yeah. I wrote Thorns and Fangs, which was 120,000 words. Then I went on the Nine Star Press website oh, and yeah. saw they had seasonal submissions, and a romance was 15,000 to 30,000 words. But an erotica was only 5,000 to 12,000 words. So I was like, oh, okay, I'm writing an erotic romance. Yep. So I wrote it. But because I <laughs> cannot not be funny, I wrote an erotic comedy, yeah. and yeah, <laughs> it didn't. It does not work. Really People are like this is hilarious, but <laughs> there's I a can't. Really huge market for short, um, short erotica, like five thousand words or less, um, that people will publish like one a week, and people just churn through them. And uh, there's a lot of money there. I've never managed to do anything like that myself, but I've like got my eye on it. <laughs> I don't think there's anything wrong with it. It's just, um, it's not where I've got to yet. Mm. Yeah, um, whenever I say that I'm going to do something or not going to something, I get bored of that thing immediately. So, <laughs> <laughs> Your contrary yeah. muse um, pushes back at you. Yeah. <laughs> so we actually did have a question from Megan that we missed earlier uh what do you think makes a character stand stand out and engaging 
So I love the difference between what a character wants and what they need. If we've got a character who is very firmly in denial about something or has ambitions that are way out of whack with their personality and capabilities, then um, that really appeals to me. Mm-hmm. And I think we we can really relate to that because basically all humans are kind of struggling to to work out where we belong, what we're meant to be doing. And I think on a very basic level, we resonate with characters who are on that journey. Um, but, and then there's also um, a, a voice that feels real. Um, I last, not last year, a few years ago, I read, read the Secret Diary of Hendrik Groen, aged 83 and a quarter. And it was a book discussion scheme book. And it's the diary of an 83 year old in a rest home in in Holland. And he is, um, he's always been quiet and mild mannered, but he's decided that the rest home management have ticked him off and it's time to rebel. And the voice pulls it off. Like on the one hand, you have a privileged old white man with antiquated thoughts, which is not my thing. But Hendrik is wry. He's very honest about like his failing body and his embarrassment. He has um, a dribbling problem and has to wear adult diapers and he is mortified about this. And yeah. he, but he is, is very right. And when he, he is his like political beliefs and stuff, but he also sort of, undercuts them with her like you know I expect if I'd been born 20 years later I wouldn't I would understand this better or I would think differently about this and it really was it was a great book and it was published anonymously and people were convinced it was a real diary and it was actually written by a 63 year old librarian but that's the voice was so good. And I just I love that. Yeah. Um, and there's also teenagers, like teenagers in real life, I do not want anything to do with. They are terrifying. Teenagers in a lot of young adult books are really self-entitled and whiny and teenagers. Mm-hmm. But there are authors who can do that teenage voice accurately yeah. but invest you anyway. Yeah. And, yeah. Yeah. and I think you do that with vulnerability and authenticity. Oh, definitely. Authenticity is a huge one for me for um, having a character stand out. So my favourite characters are all ones that have, like, a very clear, um, like, part of my personality or um, hang-up that I have or... Um, uh, Cedric, who's the the lead in my latest um, pirate series, is like me at university. Um, he has this belief that the only thing that he has to offer the world is his body, like to to have sex with as many people as he can. Which, actually, to be fair, I didn't really do that in university, but it was a belief that I had with my boyfriends um, that that was why they were with me. That I, you know because I look a certain way and I could do stuff in bed or whatever. Um, but having that moment and then all the rest of them is completely different to me, but it really resonated with someone um, messaged me and they were like, I can't, I can't believe it. This, this character, he's so promiscuous. Like he's, he's just out there. He will bang anything that moves. Um, but he's really sweet and loving at the same time. And how did you write that? And I was, and I just said, look, it was me in university. That's, that those were my beliefs 
that I had and I gave them to him and she goes oh oh that was me too <laughs> that's why I relate to him so no. much oh no that was me <laughs> I'm like they're there it's okay you know <laughs> here's a thing that was real and I put it in the character and that's that's a terrible example of it because uh, I probably shouldn't have talked about that stuff on the internet but um <laughs> And, and other characters as well like I'll give my characters my anxiety quite a lot because it's interesting to work through and to have it come up in different situations or have show on the page how they deal with what's happening how do they deal with this anxiety attack or whatever it is so I gave, I, I gave a character in a story my anxiety and I got a reader saying this is a terrible story it gave me a panic attack will not read oh. again I mean that's the risk you run that's and, and yes it becomes therapeutic for sure um the last fairyland book i wrote um that came out earlier this year called the trouble with order i was writing it while my mother got really sick and i was very stressed out i was looking after her a lot of really intense stuff happened and um my main character one of my main characters started to have all these issues with his mother and i realized that he was the way he was because of some stuff that had happened as a kid with his mother and that there were mother issues <laughs> just like pouring it all into the story and it wasn't a direct um parallel to what was happening to me at all but the fact of working through some mother issues <laughs> um came out um, on the page. i was like oops <laughs> oh well <laughs> um, i'm really wondering about why i enjoy going to just know mother-in-law now <laughs> It's a it's a safe place for you because you don't have a mother in law. So, <laughs> yeah. But yeah, um, and uh, yeah, it is. It's, it's a certain amount of therapy in there in my books. Even when I try that for there not to be, it'll bubble out. Bye, Megan. Yeah. Thank you Bye, so much Megan. for asking so many questions. It's been awesome. They have been great questions. <laughs> We can I, on for a little longer and then wrap up. Sounds fantastic. <laughs> I have, so it's usually not until after the fact, like during the editing process, that I realize, oh, this character is me addressing this issue. But yeah. it's, <laughs> I think, um, because our interpretation of reality and the world is filtered through our brain our experiences um which you know are shaped by everything we've gone through even when we think we are writing about somebody who is not us or an idea that is completely unique and different we are always writing about ourselves always like, always and that's yeah. actually the serious part of, of writing for me. <laughs> that I stopped writing for a while because um, I wrote a fanfic and somebody was like, you're just putting your kinks basically onto this character. And I was like, no, I'm not. Oh, my gosh, I am. And that was just so embarrassing that I was like putting my myself out there that I stopped yeah. writing for a while. Yeah. And... Um, it took me a while to get over that fear of unknowing and kind of displaying my ignorance or my or yeah. put it showing the world something that I don't want them to see. Yeah. 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 No, it's fascinating, isn't it? Because it's it's fantasy, but there is always this grain of truth in it from the person who's writing it. It um it's one of the things that pisses me off when I see people saying like get your politics out of your fiction this is meant to be escapism i don't want to you know see any of that your agenda like your gay agenda in the book and i'm like every single book is political like every single thing that people make is political because people are political you know and choices to include or not include something it's all political <laughs> it just makes me so angry to see i'm just like ah! like none of us are sitting in this like pristine room with no influence just like writing the words of the gods it's not a thing <laughs> yeah i do go like maybe three or four days when i forget to read the news or something oh, but yeah. but 
or check Facebook, but that is as close as it gets. Yeah, but even then, like, I mean, you've got to just, you, you want to include queer people having a good time, and that's yeah. political for some people. And if you leave out people who are gay, that's political. You know, it's just, yeah. Anyway, that's yeah. a rant and I don't need to go on right now. Um, <laughs> and I never got to this, the question that I thought of this morning, but I will save it for next time. Because yeah. I want to talk about our, our writing journeys um, from yeah. from start to end, but I'm, I'm also getting tired. So we will yeah. do it another time. This was so much fun. I still can't get over that Hogwarts Hocus thing, though. <laughs> I'm so angry that I no longer am in touch with most of my camp. Because, oh, um, Mum and John used to harass me for for talking about my camp friends. They were like, please, <laughs> you realise what people are going to think. I'm not was, really at camp. You're not really there. <laughs> yeah. Oh, amazing. Amazing. No one I knew played Hogwarts Hocus. It was all people overseas or, you know, mystery people on the on live journal. So it got very yeah. silly. I also included, I also played briefly um, Glory from Buffy, you know, the evil Oh, poet, yes. As, as a professor. Um, Brilliant. Of astronomy, I think, because she was like, well, I know about different universes, I guess. Um, and Mr. Butlertron from Yay. Glory. I love Clone High. I never did it, but I wanted to play JFK. Oh, so good. JFK is hilarious. I love Clone High so, so much. My, my role play history was Lisa from Silent Hill. She's the nurse. Okay. Yeah. Um, Mint Nagawa from Cafe Kichijoji Day, which is really it. It's a pretty obscure little manga, but it's very fun. <laughs> um, then um, Con from um, Superboy, basically. Yeah. Um, who else? I played Shaggy from Scooby Doo. So good. I played Will Stanton from The Dark Is Rising. I played Hades from Hercules for a very short time because I love Hades. I had his voice, but I could not be mean to people. Oh, yeah, yeah. It was just playing him was too stressful. Yeah. Oh, that's fair. I, I didn't play Glory a lot for the same kind of same reason, but there was someone playing Dawn um, who would freak out every time I came near. So that was quite fun um, because there was a rule that you couldn't actually hurt another character without the player's consent. So everyone knew they were safe, but... Um, I'd just be like, hi. <laughs> and she'd be like, yeah, which was quite fun. Um, I also yeah, played Clark Kent from Smallville. <gasps> so sweet. And Buffy, I apped in with Clark, and Buffy was like, oh, my God, if you're apping Clark, I'm going to app Lex. And she got in with Lex. <gasps> Fantastic. It was so good. The rest <laughs> of the DC cast hated us. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, Oh, oh okay. and then I played um, the other character. Like, I played Con for the longest time, but then I well, – my other really long-running character – oh, I had Robin from Teen Titans, the animated universe. Yeah. And yeah. that was brilliant because we also had Tim Drake Robin and we had um, Nightwing and no Batman. So it was all of, oh, 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 and we also got Damien at one point. Yay. And, and spoiler. So it was yeah. like all of the Robins with so all of the daddy issues. <laughs> it was amazing. But um, the, the character I played for the longest was um, Conan Itagawa from Detective Conan. Oh, okay. It's closed. Yeah. 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 Fun. It, it was great. It reminded me with the Robins that I did play a tabletop role-playing game a friend of mine ran in Wellington. It was just a one-off. It's called We Are Robin. And Batman has been kidnapped and all the Robins have to team up and um, and find him. And I got to play Nightwing. And we had um, a Batgirl, Damian Wayne, Tim Drake. And yeah, that might be it. One more? One more. I can't remember. But there was an amazing moment where he's like, okay, this is we're going into battle. There's a really important question I have to ask because it's going to affect how your roles go. 
who's the leader? And me and the person playing Batgirl both went, me. And we went, fuck. <laughs> <laughs> All the other characters are like, well, I think it's Nightwing. I think it's Batgirl. So we were completely split. <laughs> like, oh. I mean, it's accurate. It's accurate. <laughs> It's like brilliant. Kind of flirt with each other, but also, mm, I'm the leader, though. <laughs> oh, it's so good. I had gone into this um, horror game, and there was a Jason Todd um, oh, in his red oh, hood. That's the other character we had, we had Jason. Yeah. And um, Con had no idea who he was, right. and Jason was like, I'm not going to introduce myself. And then we got a Stephanie, and she was like, okay, oh, my God. She, so she, she made – peace with Jason yeah. and then she was like okay Superboy listen to me <laughs> like you know me you know I'm a yeah. good person yeah. you yeah. owe me for spoiling my my patrol yeah this is Red Hood forget everything you know about him he's on our side you're going to trust him and so Con and Jason started off grudgingly working together and then Stephanie disappeared. Her players stopped playing, but for them it was yeah. just like she vanished. Yeah. And so there was like months before anyone else at the DCU character into this game. So they had no one else from their universe. Yeah. And eventually they like – banter in passing and then yeah. eventually Jason had a really stupid idea that he wanted to try and he needed some muscle so he's like Superboy you're gonna be my meat chair and Tom was like sounds great let's do this and they became friends they had this amazing grudging relationship that was like neither of them would well Con was like yeah we're friends and Jason was not having it, but kind of having it. And then when the DCU cast showed up, um, Jason was like, I am not letting them take my friend away from me. <laughs> it was so, so, cute. so good. It was just <laughs> magic. The other thing that was hilarious about that game was that we got a Superboy from the animated um Teen Titans, like not the cute one, Teen Titans the Go, Justice. the other one, Young Justice. Yes, thank yeah, you. And Superboy and Con were just like, they were clone brothers. They called each other Big Brother and Little Brother. They became like, in a matter of days, they were completely codependent. <laughs> it was hilarious. That. Yeah. Really <laughs> oh. Oh, okay. We could talk about this for hours, but we should not. Um, yeah. I think we've both embarrassed ourselves enough for one night. <laughs> hey, it made us the writers we are today. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Yep. Yep. <laughs> All right. Let's do this again. Maybe like oh. once a month or something. Quick question before we go. Has anyone ever written fan fiction of one of your stories? Uh, yes. Wow. It was my wife, so I don't know how much it counts. It totally counts. <laughs> I am. I really want that to happen, and I, I really cannot. Want it to happen more organically than that too, but it was. Um, it was the one I was talking about earlier, uh, Mischief and Mayhem, with the um, roller coaster. So those two characters have a lot of chemistry, and because it's Fairyland, um, there's no there's no sex on the page. And she read it, and she got really annoyed that there was no sex, so she wrote. A sex scene for them. So she fixed it. <laughs> Yay. It's really, really good. <laughs> that is fantastic. I am so pleased. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, it's like the goal, right? Is to have someone yeah. send me fan, fan art and fan fiction. I really love to see it. I have fan art for Deep Magic. It is oh, really cool. Fantastic. <laughs> yep. Okay. You oh, have tried to leave. Good question. <laughs> All right, go to bed. <laughs> I will go to bed and uh, we'll do this again at some point, maybe in a month, maybe in two months. We'll see how we go. Yeah. <laughs> and if you're watching this after the fact and think of questions you'd like us to answer next time, please leave a comment below. Oh, Mochi. Surprise, Mochi. <laughs> if you want more surprise Mochis, please like and subscribe to Jamie's channel. 
<laughs> yeah, you never know when she'll show up. Yep. Or what she's going to do. She's going to sit down. Okay, that's not very exciting. Right. Yes. So like, comment and subscribe. <laughs> Go follow Jillian's uh, uh, YouTube channel as well because that's where we do sprints a lot of the time. But most importantly, leave us questions to answer in the comments below this video. Absolutely. This was a lot of fun. It was great. <laughs> All right. Thanks for tuning in whenever it is that you happen to tune in. And we'll see you again another time. Bye. Bye.